the way it's sharing, it's not. I'm not getting a PowerPoint menu. Um, right. But uh, don't worry about it. I, I wrote hard. I didn't write many notes anyway, so there's no. Big right, one. Bevan. I've just got a little bit of crackly audio on your end. Okay, let me sit in a bit closer. Is that better? I can't see myself either at the moment. Oh, let me Nick, how's that sound for you, Nick? Um, that's still pretty bad from my end. Sorry. <laughs> testing. Let's try testing. putting those. Let, let's try popping those um, AirPods in. That's okay. Sorry, Bevan. This is why we have a practice. This is lovely. <laughs> sure. Is that better there? Can you hear me? What sound button? Oh, it's quite a long way. Okay. Yep. Yeah, that's fine. Let me just check what happens if I get to this one. So if I put that down, can you hear that when I put it down? You might just need a so the do you want sound rotates as well? internally on the tibia, and that's called screwing home the knee into a the close yeah. I definitely position. need you to pause position it. Once you take stability. them out, pause. The ACL okay. play does that for the, the last the volume, degrees. and then as soon as you go again. beyond thirty degrees of flexion into okay. deeper flexion, ACL starts to relax and it's just sitting. At Inside the knee. Okay. All right. So I'll start with the headphones, and uh, I can't. Unfortunately, I can't hear the audio. Maybe we actually, Bevan. Let's keep your headphones off. I apologies for going back and forth. I think it may have just been some some issues prior, but. Um, yeah, as long as your Bluetooth's off and it's not connecting to your headphones, I think your MacBook will be fine. So yeah. just do an audio test for me. Testing, testing. I'll speak in a bigger voice when I'm presenting. So. Yeah, yeah. no, that for some reason that's much clearer on my end. Nick, is that the same for you? Yeah, good from my end. That's yeah, so let let's good. just remove those AirPods. Okay. And we'll be good to go. I just. So what I'm going to do is, Bevan, I'm going to allow everyone to get into the into the webinar. Okay. Um, so you can either turn off your camera until I until I start speaking, or you can leave it on. It's totally up to you. Um, I will start roughly around one to two minutes after the hour, and essentially you're just waiting for me to finish the introduction, and I'll say. I will now turn the. I'll now pass the time over to Bevan Collis to start his presentation, and then that's when you would begin. Okay. Sounds good. Wonderful. I'll just leave the camera on. I'll, I'll probably mess up if I try and turn it off and on. No, no problem at all.
before I let everyone in, Bevan, we have 160 people registered for tonight, um, a range of different professions. Um, the breakdown was a little bit of an error in regards to the breakdown, so unfortunately I don't have that for you right now. Okay. Um, but we normally get about 50% attendance rate, so. Okay, no worries. Lovely. All right, I'm just going to open this now. Uh, Nick, if you can go and mute, and I will also. Thank you, Dan. Good luck. Thank you. Hi everyone, welcome and thank you for joining our webinar tonight. For our webinar this evening, we are joined by Bevan Collis, who will present on Unlocking Healing Potential, Bracing Emotion Restriction to Optimize Healing. Before we kick off the presentation, we'll run through some quick housekeeping. Your lines have been muted to ensure that we minimize any background noises during the presentation. So if you do have any questions, please send a message through to the Q&A section, which is located at the top of your screen. We are joined by an OSA rep, Nick, who will be able to narrate those questions back to Bevan at the end of the session for a little bit of a Q&A for those who are wanting to stick around. Bevan will be able to answer all your questions at the end of the presentation. We are excited to announce that we are recording this webinar and a copy of the recording will be available to download on, and which will be also uploaded to the OSA website for you to download and watch following the webinar tonight. We will also notify you via email when this is available to access, uh, which should shortly be after the webinar within seven to 10 business days. I would now like to pass the time over to Bevan to start his presentation. Thank you, Jaden. Um, 
Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. And uh, thanks also to Manish and Nick for helping me set up uh, the talk tonight. And I was excited to be given the opportunity to present, especially for Osser, which is a brand I've always um, been a fan of. I think it's pretty cool that such a small country like Iceland with less than half a million people is producing um, such amazing products and competing with the big behemoths from the States um, and all over the world, producing some of the best stuff that we do. I wish as Australians with 25 million people, we could have a <laughs> company is good, but we'll stick to digging stuff out of the ground, what we're good at, I guess. So um, anyway, let's get on to it. Um, if I can go to the next slide. Okay, so tonight I'm gonna to talk about unlocking healing potential, uh, knee bracing and, and bracing other parts of the body too, uh, to try and improve healing results, um, particularly for traumatic soft tissue injuries. Okay, so a little bit about me to begin with. Uh, I graduated from the University of Sydney in 1999, and before that I did a degree in Human Movement Studies that I finished in 1992. Uh, my wife, Vanessa, is also a physio. We met at university. We um, took a bit of a left-field choice to move to Tokyo three years out in 2002 and set up a clinic there servicing the expats uh, of Tokyo, and then as the kind of skiing in Japan b boom started in the early 2000s. We used to go snowboarding ourselves in the Seco every year on our own holidays from Tokyo and started to see more and more foreigners there. And we decided to set up Niseko Physio in 2005. Initially it was just a good excuse for me to snowboard a lot, but uh, skiing in Japan just got bigger and bigger and bigger and we kind of rode that wave and now have clinics also in Hakuba, Nozawa, Myoko. And in 2013, we moved to Singapore and we have currently got two clinics in Singapore, one in Camden Medical Center and one inside an international school. And we're opening one in the CBD uh, in January. Uh, so here's a little picture of our some of our ski clinics the one on the left there is is uh, was our first one back in 2005 in the building that's now demolished called the brick um, so uh, these ski clinics have have given us a quite a unique uh, clinical experience because we're they're all located in quite rural areas in, in Japan and uh, often without much medical help around so they kind of function almost as acute care clinics uh, so it's a very different clinical experience to working in your typical suburban city clinics and i've seen hundreds if not probably in the thousands of acute acls and mcls and um, having these conversations with patients every day has kind of led me to having a special interest in those areas because we really want to be providing our patients great advice so um, we tend to really focus on keeping updated with those acute soft tissue injury management. And there has been a lot of change in the way that we manage those patients over the last 15 years. So that's our team during winter. Um, I wouldn't recommend getting in the snow sports business from a business perspective. It's a tough slog feeling like you're um, doing well in April and then broke as a joke again at this time of year. I'm waiting for the snow to fall. Uh, I also uh, host a knee injury podcast called The Knee Gurus, where I interview a range of experts in knee injuries, focus on ACL um, experts from around the world. So check that out on Spotify if you're uh, suffering from insomnia. Uh, so I'm starting on uh, snow sports injuries. I know, um, give you a little bit of background about, about what we do. So knee injuries obviously are uh, very common in snow sports, always been a problem for alpine skiers. They account for about 30 to 40% of all ski injuries. Um, and the binding technology kind of remains that if the, if the ski doesn't release at the time of, of the person falling or the catching an edge, that force often translates up through the extra long lever arm and ends up at the knee causing injuries. The Ottawa rules for knee injuries, our guys in the ski resorts uh, need to know these back to front. 
seems almost a bit old school these days where they scan everything. Um, but for us in these areas where it's quite difficult for our patients to get to um, investigative centres, um, we still value these and, and uh, make sure we follow them quite carefully. The extra rule that we've kind of added in is pain on palpation of the tibia plateau, um, the lateral femoral condyle. Um, tibial plateau, just to check if there's a chance of a tibial plateau fracture and lateral femoral condyle help give you some information if there had been a patella dislocation if you're thinking about that as well. Okay, so the injuries, your MCL, uh, it's the number one injury we see. A lot of people say, what, what's the number one injury we see? It's definitely the MCL. Um, about one quarter of all injuries we see are MCL, plus or minus an ACL and a, and a meniscus, particularly in low and beginner uh, intermediate skiers. Um, it's graded in a one to three scale. Um, and yeah, an excessive snow plow. Sometimes you see the bilateral MCLs where both feet go kind of beyond the no return into the split stance, um, catching an edge or hitting a tree. So an MCL, they've got a really familiar presentation. Uh, you generally have patients reporting a feeling of overstretching rather than, than the classic ACL pop. Uh, you usually don't see gross swelling and oedema if it's injured in isolation. So a clinical tip, if you're looking at an acute knee and it's really swollen, it's almost certainly not an MC, a vanilla isolated MCL. There's probably some other structure in the knee that's damaged as well. Um, they have a little bit of instability, but they're not really giving the information that their knee feels super wobbly like an ACL person might. Um, they're quite, they're, the pain of an MCL injury is quite specific. Um, it, it's really well located, obviously, on the medial aspect of the knee, and you might even find patients kind of rubbing it during the history where they'll say, oh, it's just like right down here, and they're very specific about where it hurts, whereas the ACL pain's a little bit more um, hard to nail down. Uh, they may have pretty high function. They may have skied on for quite a bit more, may be able to uh, weight bear well, but other people might not be weight bearing well. So, But a lot of them can function quite high, even with higher grade ones. Um, the pain generally increases on the first night of the injury, so I always kind of pre-warn if they come in on day zero and they'll say, oh, it's not hurting that much now, I'll say, well, just wait till tonight, it probably will be, and um, you might expect a, a sleepless night on the first and second night, waking night is common with MCLs, and also the way people roll over in bed can add a bit of valgus force. Okay, the ACL, you know, obviously people, you're, you're listening for that, uh, or asking about hearing a, if they heard a pop in the knee. Sometimes somebody nearby uh, hears a pop and there's also a bit of a pop when the ski releases from the binding. So you need to question a little bit to differentiate between those. People often feel that sense of instability. You know, does your knee feel wobbly? Pain, swelling and function, once again, can be highly variable. You can have really high functioning ACLs who maybe even skied on for the rest of the day. Um, and even things like um, range of motion, most of the time people can't fully straighten or bend the knee, but if, it's not, if they don't have a lot of edema, you might be surprised even an acute ACL can maybe achieve full extension or bend down to full squat as well. That's not sort of diagnostic. The swelling tends to increase in the first 24 hours, uh, and they tend to be quite fearful of weight bearing because of that instability feeling. Snowboarders do their ACL a lot less than skiers, 20 times. We probably see 20 skiers for every one ACL that we see. Um, and usually it's a high impact injury, like hitting a tree or landing from a big jump, someone um, yeah, landing from a big booter in the park or something like that. Whereas the ski ACL can often and often is a, a low force, low speed injury because the low speed ones, um, the skis don't release. Okay, calf muscle tears, we see a lot of these. Uh, they're very common in middle-aged skiers, particularly men. Uh, it's usually the gastrocnemius that goes, uh, which is you know, obviously the two-joint muscle. And as you, most of your skiing is done with the soleus, once the knee's bent, the gastroc sort of folds and the ski, soleus does most of the work when they're skiing. So we do a lot of work training people how to, how to keep the knee bent and, and really be strict with keeping the knee bent when they're skiing and even walking around town. So there's a saying in the snow sports injury business that people can, can ski before they can walk. Um, and they do very well with heel raises in the shoe. So just very small ones that will 
touch a little bit more when we get to the key component of the talk on um, on approximation and, and reduction. Um, so the heel raises just brings that calf muscle into a slightly shortened position. We see quite a lot of syndesmosis. Uh, you don't see a lot of vanilla ankle sprains because you know you obviously can't roll your ankle in a ski boot, but um, the, the uh, syndesmosis that holds the tibia and um, fibula together can get sprained, particularly on high impact falls where they want to bow apart. Um, these once again need to be braced ASAP because in weight bearing those two bones do want to shift apart and they will keep re-tearing it. Um, they do need a weight bearing x-ray which can be very hard to get in the ski fields of Japan so um, we encourage people to get those as soon as they can. Wrist injury is very key, uh, common in snowboarders, much more likely to um, fracture their wrist. And we've got a rule in our clinics that with wrists, we just assume it's a fracture unless proven otherwise, because the wrist is so flexible. You can do ligaments in your wrist, obviously, but it's m more common to do fractures. So 70% of all wrist injuries are fractures. Um, and beginners are at higher risk. Only, um, there's still not a heap of people wearing wrist guards, even less in Japan. Um, and just uh, one for your um, dinner parties or bar conversations in ski resorts. Everybody wants to know if wrist guards reduce the chance of wrist fractures. Some people suggest that they'll just shift the fracture further up the arm. Um, there is pretty good evidence to show one way or the other. One was in with this laboratory studies, I guess, where they harvested a wrist off a cadaver and put it in one of those uh, loading plates like they test the furniture in Ikea and s put increasing load until the wrist breaks and they found that the load was significantly higher uh, cause to cause a fracture with the guard on than with the guard off. Uh, an epidemiological study, they did a survey of 7,000 snowboarders in Colorado and the snowboarders that were wearing wrist guards were half as likely to have experienced a fracture. And there was a randomised control trial where they gave a bunch of people a um, half of them a wrist guard and half of them did not have a wrist guard and there was less injuries in the wrist guard group. So conclusion is wrist guards do work, um, especially for your thin boned beginners. Okay, I don't wear wrist guards. Um, obviously, been snowboarding a long time, um, but it's the beginners who are always falling on the outstretched hand and particularly your skinny type thin wrist uh, beginners, they're super high risk of a wrist fracture. Um, shoulder injuries uh, tend to be a little bit more common in snowboarders, um, particularly with the AC joint and also shoulder dislocation. There's a saying in the ski business that everyone you see in the ski resort with her arm in a sling is a snowboarder and everyone you see using crutches is a skier. There's a certain Truth to that, snowboarders tend to do upper limb and skiers do lower limb. Um, the AC joint we try and reduce a little bit. We'll talk a little bit more about later in, uh, with a sling or at least um, resting the elbow to sort of push the humerus back up in and, and, and try and um, reduce the distance between the clavicle and the acromion. Uh, same for skier's thumb, it's a very, very common injury. It's basically like an MCL tear in your thumb. Um, second most common injury for skiers after, um, after MCLs. It's, uh, once again, you, need to, you should get an X-ray. High grade three uh, skier's thumb ruptures may need surgery and they're reduced with a thumb splint, okay? So let's get into the, the sort of meat and bones of, of the talk now about um, how to manage these acute soft tissue injuries. So there is kind of a lack of consensus of the best management for a lot of these soft tissue injuries. This is, the same injury can be treated very differently by different health professionals in different parts of the world have got their own ways of treating injuries. So there's a, there is a bit of a poor understanding of the optimal position for healing for a lot of these injuries. Um, and generally there's a focus on preventing atrophy and stiffness and that probably comes from from us as, as physios as we tend to um, be really worried about people losing strength and losing flexibility and keeping people moving so um, we probably focus more on that side of it than than the healing side of it and we'll talk a little bit about that dichotomy later 
Um, so, you know, does getting people moving and early mobilization reduce the chance of actually at- obtaining a better heal to the acutely damaged tissue? Um, and there's also a pretty poor understanding of which injuries have the capacity to heal and which cannot. All right, uh, so we'll just zoom out a little bit into the basic principles of orthopedics. Um, this, these terms are not ones that were taught to me regularly at um, physio school, and nor ones that we have used a lot up until the last, uh, up until recently in our clinical practice as well. But I'm sure the orthopods uh, use these terms a lot, particularly when it comes to learning about fractures and how to re, um, to manage fractures. So that one of them is the reduction, approximation, and involution. So let's just go into those um, terms. This, so this term of reduction uh, is a really common orthopedic term uh, to describe fractures, you know, RF fracture, open reduction, internal fixation. So this principle of reduction means that the bones, the fracture is reduced or it's to be made less, made less like a fracture sort of Piling, that, piling the bones back in as close as possible order to normal as you can get. Okay, so then they'll decide the best way to keep them there, whether it's with surgery or with casting, um, or, or maybe it doesn't need any um, management at all, or maybe bracing. But uh, the important thing, I think, to, to note about the surgery and after a fracture has been reduced, it's not the the plates and screws and rods that do the healing or that hold the, they just hold the bone together and the body will heal the bone for them. Okay, so, um, and it's this principle of reduction that maybe we need to start thinking a little bit more about for soft tissue injuries as well as just bony injuries. Okay, so the other one is this other word that seems to be coming across my radar a lot more recently, which is involution. Uh, which if you look at the word up until a while ago, I'd never really heard that word or, or heard it used very much. Um, the word itself, if you, if you look at the word, it's the antonym of evolution, okay? So uh, evolution is to become something more, something better, something greater. The antonym means involution. It's becoming something less sort of shrinking um, back into itself. So in anatomical terms and for physiology, we use it to describe, it's very commonly used to describe uh, uh, postnatal uh, uterus, and they're increasingly using it in soft tissue injuries as well. So it means the uterus is shrinking down. And when it comes to, uh, say, ACL or any tissue that's been totally sort of separated or, or partially separated, uh, if they can't meet and the healing can't begin, then that uh, causes involution. So the, the interesting thing I found on when I was researching was this was the time here on the right, you see that uh, the womb involutes in, a, in as fast as nine days after the baby's been born. And that time frame is very similar to the healing window that can close for a soft tissue uh, rupture as well. So we, we really want to act quickly. All right. So we understand when it comes to bones, once again, that the body begins to try to, the body uh, tries to heal soon after the injury. But it's also the same for soft tissue. And we've heard that, you know, if the bones are healed in the wrong position, the surgeon will have to re-break the body and, and put the bones in the right position so that it heals correctly. Um, but I think the important thing is that, that yeah, w- that the clock's sort of ticking, this uh, magic healing window in between five and up to 20 days, if that's where the body's desperately trying to, to heal the soft tissue. And if it can't, it just gives up, leaving, with, leaving us with an involuted uh, stumps, okay? Um, so the body really wants to heal, even after injuries that you'll hear cannot heal. Um, everything in the body can heal. The only exception, they say, apparently, is, is the enamel of teeth. Um, so we need to provide the optimal environment for the soft tissue to heal and to prevent this involution through this next principle of optimal approximization. So to approximate the injury is uh, to try and uh, get the, the injured parts as close together as, as possible, okay? Hence the approximate. Um, so we're trying to push the injured tissues together as close as they can so that the body can do their do its magic by healing, same as the surgeons were doing with their plates and screws for fractures. Um, we're using braces increasingly to do for soft tissue injuries, okay? And like I say, it's, it's kind of counterintuitive to us as physios. 
where we never want to see a joint sort of frozen up and locked down. We just want to, no, let's get you moving. We, we, and for all the ACLs we've seen, we have been actually quite um, proactive and, and um, in getting people moving early because it, that that's just tends to be our, our instinct, mobilise, stretch and strengthen. You know, in case of some problems, like we know there's very good evidence for lower back pain that locking the injury down um, doesn't help. You know, but um, same as post-op, we want to get people moving in those situations, and this is correct. But in some acute tissue injuries, um, we do need to think about the tissue healing more and, and forget about um, the mobilising stretch and strengthen for a little bit. So the closer the tish, torn tissues are together, the better the heal. The closer they're approximated, the more likely you are to get a better heal. So this principle of reduction and approximation to prevent involution you know hand therapists get it they've got it for 30 years and they use it as the cornerstone principle of their treatment okay that's how they treat mallet finger your volar plate fracture right you've got to uh, have your finger in this splint for six weeks you know if you blow it and take your finger off and straighten it up um, you can ruin the healing and you have to go back in the splint and you know possibly start again the same for skier's thumb so these guys have been all over this, but us for the, that are managing lower limbs, for whatever reason, we haven't really paid much attention to it. Um, and yeah, that has also, because maybe because we haven't been paying attention to it, and maybe that's because of us physios thinking that everybody has to keep moving um, constantly all the time. Um, there hasn't been a lot of good research on it. There's limited consensus about the best range of motion for a lot of these soft tissue injuries. So it is a developing area. Um, it's harder for patients and uh, for healthcare professionals to get our heads around because we can't see it. We can't um, visualize it like you might be able to with the bone and the concepts. You can't see whether the tissue is healing inside your skin or not. Um, so you do really need to educate the people and, and I know the guys that um, doing the cross bracing protocol using this analogy to fractures quite a lot to, to buy patient to you know to get patients buy in to go through the 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 period of reduction and, and um, healing that's involved in in um, restricting the range of motion okay um, it is a bit back to the future this is the way they used to manage it I have heard stories of patients in ski resorts in other rural areas of Japan where the doctors are sticking a new knee injury in a cast and we used to kind of laugh at the you know silly old school Japanese who are casting acute knee um, soft tissue injuries but you know maybe they were correct and we were wrong um, all right uh, so medial collateral ligament let's dig a little bit deeper than the superficial stuff we talked a bit earlier about skiing and talk about the best way to get a good heel out of the MCL it's the most common injury uh, in the knee, uh, it's an extra capsular ligament. It uh, gets good blood supply. It's actually a thickening of the joint capsule. It tends to be whenever we see an image of an MCL in a textbook or, or uh, on a model, it's the, they strip the joint capsule away can you, so you can see it. So it's a bit like that image there. But in reality, there is a capsule attached to it on either side. So if, even if you've done a grade three, it's not like the stumps are kind of flapping in the in the breeze. They are attached to a certain extent by the knee joint capsule. It's got deep and superficial fibers. We grade it on a one, two, three scale where, um, I'm sure you guys know this, but yeah, grade one's a partial tear with no laxity, grade two's partial tear with laxity, and grade three is a, is a complete rupture. And I think we like to reserve the grade three uh, diagnosis for people who've got instability or a positive valgus stress test in full extension plus uh, 30 degrees flexion. Um, it's maybe a bit more of a severe injury than we've considered in the past because we see them several times a day. You just think, oh, she, you know, she, it was just an MCL, that's it. But um, it, an MCL does have a very important role to play in the knee. Uh, it's an important stabilizer. Obviously it protects them against valgus force, but also protects against rotation. And if an MCL doesn't heal well or is left torn, or while it is torn, it does expose the ACL to a bit more of its load, preventing the uh, rotation. So um, there's a little bit 
of a push towards uh, operating on MCLs on those uh, grade threes that we talked about. Um, and yeah, once again, things come and go in, in fashion, in health. Uh, back in the 80s, I was listening to a podcast with Merv Cross on it, who was saying that early in his career, everybody was just operating on the extra capsule lignum. This was all about the MCL and LCL, and people weren't so focused on the ACL back in the 70s and 80s, uh, and they were operating on MCLs all the time. Then they went away to operating on ACLs all the time, and MCLs currently non-surgical. Um, so the MCL strain through different flexion angles. Now we're getting into to, to this talk about what is the ideal range of motion for healing, which is this topic of a little bit of debate at the moment. Um, we can see this kind of U-shaped uh, chart on the uh, force that the MCL is put through. So the force is lowest in its mid uh, range. Okay, so the deep and superficial fibers are um, at different angles, so it's a little bit more complex. Some are, are, are taught at um, flexion and others are taught at extension, but it seems to be that mid-range is when the MCL is under the lowest load. So um, what evidence is there for MCL? I um, reached out to uh, uh, my good friend and legend physio, Wenny Tan, who worked 11 seasons for us in Niseko and also probably a dozen seasons in Mount Hotham. Uh, and is currently working as a extended scope practitioner. Um, very, and for her masters in physio, she did her own uh, systematic review, which she kindly gave to me. And she's that Excel chart there is a, a list of every paper that's ever been published on MCLs. Basically, there was another systematic review done in twenty fifteen um, that uh, gave uh, so kind of came to some conclusions, but it was done on poor quality evidence. The evidence around MCL is not super strong, but it seems to be that there is uh, this pretty strong belief that um, the MCL can, can heal, obviously, when the uh, torn ends, are, even if they're not approximated. Um, and that the ideal range seems to be around about somewhere in the mid-substance. In Australia, a lot of doctors tend to do 30 to 60, some lock it at 30. In our clinics, we lock it to 30 to 90 and get pretty good uh, outcome. Once again, every patient's a little bit different. Um, so, but yeah, it seems to be that, that, that somewhere between 30 and 60 and 30 to 90 is the ideal approximated angle uh, where you're gonna get most approximate approximation of the MCL uh, damaged tissue. So once again, these studies are done on uh, wide spectrums of the population, uh, where but we um, treat individual patients. Not so we need to weigh up the risk of stiffness versus ligament healing. So if it's a young, active person, uh, you're probably going to be really strict on the range of motion restriction and maybe keep them even restricted for a little bit longer to make sure you get optimal healing. But if it's an older person who might be at higher risk of getting a stiff knee, that might cause them a little bit of trouble, you might be a little bit less strict on how long they're in the restricted range of motion. Um, the gold standard, when he said, was, was to assess every individual patient and find out where they're lax and try and uh, customise your restricted range of motion to meet the laxity you find in the assessment. Um, as far as MCL bracing, we often give our patients uh, two choice. There's for the Osso guys, there's a plug for your... Uh, braces, the CTI and the uh, rebound post-op, uh, both very good braces. Um, the CTI or these functional knee braces, is obviously quite a few of them on the market. They tend to prevent that valgus force that we want to get rid of or that we want to protect against. Sorry about those chimes there. Uh, let's see if I can close my window that keeps buzzing. Um, and but it can be quite tight to wear all day. But the good thing about it, they are more expensive, but we say to patients, you can keep them and wear, the, wear it in the future for skiing. Whereas these post-op braces, they're a little bit more comfortable, they're a little bit looser, uh, and they're cheaper, um, but you can't really use them for sports. So once you've finished your range of motion restriction protocol, um, it's not much use to you, I guess. Um, and they're a little bit more bulky, so um, both have got their pros and cons for going through, not just for MCL, but for any of these range of motion restriction protocols, those kind of pros and cons 
uh, stand uh, kind of appropriate to all of them. And you know, if money is no option or people, you know, you've got to go through these six, eight, 12 week protocols. Sometimes we'll say to people, use the post-op brace around the house. And if you're going outside, particularly the, the um, icy streets in the ski resorts of Japan, we're a more functional one there. Okay, the posterior cruciate ligament, the PCL, um, it functions to resist um, posterior translation of the tibia related to the femur, and particularly in that 90 to 100 degree flexion. Okay, so it seems to be, if you have a look at the chart here, the force on the PCL is quite low in extension. Okay, rather than that U-shaped force we had where the force was lowest kind of in mid uh, range of knee flexion. This one's lowest when the knee's straight. So we tend to think that the PCL is best approximated in full extension. Uh, there's two options there as well. You've got the uh, PCL brace that are um, extremely expensive, uh, about $3,000 here in Singapore, but I think probably a little bit cheaper in, in Australia. Um, but the advantage of those is that they will give you that same level of approximation but that you get an extension through that dial uh, but allow you to bend your knee to 60 degrees while maintaining the approximation of the PCL healing. So the budget version is your old school Zimmer splint that just keeps the knee dead straight for six weeks. Um, it's obviously more bulky, hard to wear that 24-7 for six weeks, um, but it's cheaper and easy, I guess. Um, Okay, so the posterior lateral corner injury is a wolf in sheep's clothing. It's one as clinicians that we do not want to miss. Um, there's a growing consensus that it also is best approximated in full knee extension. Um, a little clinical tip, if you are assessing somebody who you think might have had a patella dislocation or um, a posterior lateral corner injury. If the patient's kind of talking about using the words like dislocation, you might even have a patient say that their patella dislocated. Um, and Winnie has got a great uh, case study that she did of a patient who reported a, a patella dislocation using those words, but she palpated the lateral femoral condyle and found there was no pain there. And that kind of set off thing. If your patella is dislocating, you're probably going to have pain on the lateral femoral condyle as the patella sort of um, goes over it. So uh, use that to kind of, as a little clinical gem to differentiate a PLC and a dislocated patella. Uh, so there's, we think that it's best approximated straight. So these multi-ligament injuries, uh, posterior lateral corner, you know, someone who gets one with a lot, ACL, MCL, uh, posterior cruciate ligament, you can't approximate all ligaments um, at the same time because they've got uh, different optimal angles. So it seems to be the management that is settled on is that you sacrifice the ACL and MCL by keeping the knee straight, which is the best position for the PLC and the PCL. Okay, so maybe you surgically repair the ACL and the MCL later because you, you're thinking they're not gonna heal well in a Zimmer splint. Um, but the other two are, and the other two are maybe um, more important or there's more structures, particularly in the posterior lateral corner. Okay, anterior cruciate ligament, the big daddy. Uh, we all love to talk about ACLs um, and the big questions for the big daddy. Can it heal? Um, what is the best approximated position? Which is uh, another huge question. Um, the current research to can it heal? Uh, almost definitely. Okay, people that are still saying that ACL can't heal are um, just wrong. Uh, it can and does. Uh, what is the best approximated position? It seems to be 90 degrees, but there's not as good evidence around that as there is for the ability to heal. Okay, um, we'll dig more into that later. Um, does surgery prevent early osteoarthritis? Does it prevent meniscal tears? Does it improve return to sport rates? It seems to be the best evidence we have at the moment is no, no, no. Um, thanks, Amy Winehouse. Do we need to avoid open chain exercises post-op? Uh, not only are they safe, but they seem to be essential. Okay, so there's so many myths around ACL management at the moment. It's like we've gotten a lot more wrong than we have got right. Uh, Okay, so the evidence for ACL surgery to prevent OA and secondary injury is poor. If you want to read up 
about uh, ACL versus non-ACL, just so put in Stephanie Phil Bay into your Google Scholar or your PubMed, it'll save you time. <laughs> and um, you get a lot of great information there. Uh, so open chain knee exercises, uh, not only are they very safe, but they are the best way to get quads firing. Um, I'd highly recommend you read this paper here. It's an easy uh, one to re remember because it's got this quirky title, Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf? Open chain exercises after ACL reconstruction. Um, this is us, we've got this isokinetic knee machine, which is really good. Uh, and we also you know, use the Val Dynamo to do isometrics holds to a certain number and we've got um, yeah, we're a bit biased because we've got we've also got the eccentric uh, leg extension. We've got almost every uh, knee open chain knee exercise in our clinic here in Singapore. Uh, this is a little graph that I made up because I have this conversation with all the patients that we're talking to soon after they've ruptured their ACL. That I think if you are speaking to patients who've just ruptured their ACL, I think it's good for them to get their heads around this and for uh, healthcare professionals as well. So you're going along in your normal life, your knee's functioning at 100%, bang, you pop your ACL, your function drops down, okay? Your knee's pretty uh, in a bad way, okay? And, and this point here where we go to 40 at the ACL rupture, that tends to be the point where people are making their decisions, okay? Oh, there's no way I can live my life like this. And my knee's wobbly, uh, it's swollen, it's painful, I'm walking with a limp, blow it, I'm gonna get the surgery. And that's when all the, the decisions uh, are made. Um, but if you get people to wait, whether with or without a bracing protocol, you'll find they, that the knee just gets better and better and better. And at 12 weeks post-injury, they're starting to feel like they're up at 90. Think, well, I can you know, live my life with a knee like this. But then you have a surgery and boom, you're back down even lower than you were after the injury. And I think that's what some, a lot of people don't understand. Because some people think, oh, I couldn't bother doing the rehab. I'm just going to get the surgery. It's, it's a, they see it as a shortcut. And it's, it's definitely not a shortcut. It's a longer pathway back to normal from the surgery than it is from the original rupture, I think, in a, in a nutshell. And most people don't see the journey out. I'm sure all you physios out there will know people just burn out on their ACL rehab. So there's not many of them. I mean, professional athletes are a bit different, um, but there's not, many, not that many people who... I think the, the figures are, are less than... Uh, a fewer than 20% of people complete their ACL um, rehabilitation well. So when we're having these conversations to people about uh, to reconstruct or not, number one at the top with a bullet is their future sporting goals. Okay, if you just want to hike and ride a bike and um, you know go swimming or kick a soccer ball back and forth with your kids, you don't really need an ACL, um, and that ties in with your age. Okay, if you're an 18 year old with high future sporting goals and you've ruptured your ACL, you're definitely much more likely to do well with surgery or be a surgical candidate. These episodes of stability, whether you've got other injuries, and then there's also seasonal considerations, insurance considerations, and and finally that may that number seven might be getting up to number one uh, in the very near future is your chance of healing. So let's get into the topic of ACL healing. I know you've got Jane Rooney's presentation that she did a few weeks ago that I will try not to cross over. Um, pardon the pun too much on. Um, so I actually did my own Google search on ACL injury and after seeing um, 45 uh, orthopedic surgeons here in Singapore advertising their surgeries uh, for, sorry, um, for $50 a click. Um, after I clicked on them all, I forgot what I was searching about. But anyway, um, no, so on the right, we've got some good results. The ACL cannot heal on its own because there's no uh, blood supply to this ligament is what you'll get these days if you search can the ACL heal on Google in Singapore. But it does have blood supply. Uh, it's serviced by the medial genicular artery that basically becomes this cocoon, which is the uh, synovial membrane. So it, the synovial membrane actually functions as a uh, blood supplier to the ACL, okay? So I was lucky enough to uh, visit the stadium clinic in Sydney in August of this year, and Tom and the team there uh, were very kind to let me hang out for the day and see what they do. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard of the cross-bracing protocol. Uh, if you haven't, in a nutshell, uh, it is uh, 
around approximating the ACL by bending the knee to 90 degrees to give it its maximal chance of healing. So it's getting a lot more press around the place. You'll see this uh, report was recently shown on network TV in the US, tonight. I think last week. It's a common week. and dreaded injury, but is surgery always the best way to repair a torn ACL? Liz Kreutz with a surprising study. It's happened to soccer legend Megan Rapino, NFL quarterback Daniel Jones, even aspiring mixed martial arts fighter Mark Zuckerberg. ACL... You get the idea. Anyway, you can watch that. Um, but basically, uh, non-surgical ACL is uh, getting a lot of press at the moment. The patient's going to increasingly oh, ask about it. Um, so let's uh, talk about how we can optimise the healing. As before, we said the posterior cruciate ligament, as the name suggests, it's the opposite of the anterior cruciate ligament. The, the posterior cruciate is approximated most in full extension. So kind of intuitively, at that sort of low level of, of intuitive thought, you think the ACL is the op opposite, perhaps, and it's approximated, it's doing less in, um, in not a deeper bend. Okay, so I'll pass it over to Tom Cross, who can probably articulate this much better than me. The last 30 degrees into full extension. So the femur rotates internally on the tibia, and that's called screwing home the knee into a the closed pack position, the position of most stability. The ACL does that for the last 30 degrees. As soon as you go beyond 30 degrees of flexion into deeper flexion, the ACL starts to relax and it's just sitting inside the knee doing nothing. So, and the magic angle is 50 degrees. So from 50 degrees of knee flexion into extension, the ACL is being strained or it's, it's, it's functioning because it, it screws the femur home into a close pack position of stability and beyond 50 it's very relaxed so we got a surgeon to look at the acl arthroscopically on the right is the sagging redundant acl at 90 degrees that's a normal acl then you can see it torn or uh, at length at, from 30 degrees to full extension and it's the last 30 okay uh so there's that screw home mechanism the acl is working hard when it's straight so we should, uh, and it's taut, okay? So for new ACLs, uh, if we push the knee straight, we're basically pulling the stumps of the ACL apart and reducing the chance of achieving a heel. Um, as Tom sort of said, the magic there happened in that study was done in 2007 that shows similar to the force on the MCL and, um, and um, posterior cruciate before, the force is lower, deeper bend in the knee, but they don't go beyond 90 degrees. Um, because of obvious reasons it's too hard to bend that deeply. So you've got this third option now for ACL healing to try the ACL bracing protocol. Um, we'll probably leave it at that. You can go and watch Jane Rooney's presentation if you wanted some more details on the cross bracing protocol. Uh, but this same principle of approximation, preventing involution um, and reduction for soft tissue injuries, not just fractures, also gaining a bit more attention to Achilles tendon ruptures and other soft tissue injuries. So, um, you know, this article in Sydney Morning Herald is 10 years old, but um, it was on the sort of beginning of the conservative management towards Achilles tendon rupture, and it's the same principle, basically. We're putting, as soon as the rupture happens, or very soon after it happens, while, while that magic healing window's open, you get them in 25 degrees plan of flexion using um, a cam walker with heels in it or one of the higher tech uh, cam walker boots and progressively straighten a little bit as the as the healing um, continues. Um, there's some evidence for non-surgical treatment for proximal hamstring tear as well and possibly a similar 90 degree knee flexion range um, could be appropriate for ulnar collateral ligament tears of the elbow. There's the Tommy John surgery, which is like a reconstructive, reconstructing a new um, ulnar collateral ligament, similar to the MCL. But non-surgical management is increasing. But the, once again, there's not as much consensus and limited research on the ideal range of motion restriction for this problem. So you know, like I said before, we're way behind the um, the hand therapists on this um, for biceps avulsion injury. Once again, it depends on the 
the the amount of approximation uh, from the rupture to to the stump if any of these injuries are healable or not and there's not a heap of injury because we just tend to think just go in and operate um, the ankle sprain kind of zooming out a little bit it's another one of these injuries that you can have the same injury and get totally different management depending on where you are all over the world there's not a really good understanding there's been a lot of research into it and some research, some of it shows that functional treatment and getting people moving are preferable to mobilization and maybe it depends on the grade of the injury as well um, but it's another sort of poorly understood soft tissue injury where the best practice management is hard to to, to, to nail down um, so just in conclusion um, a lot of these research applies to cross sections of the population and remember every patient is an individual in front of you and needs um, their own assessment and should be considered on their own merits according to the variables of each patient um, and there is still some trade-off between stiffness and atrophy versus uh, soft tissue healing um, versus the complications of the surgical repair that we need to consider. Um, so that's about it for my presentation. There's um, my little Lola Chan daughter up uh, looking at Mount Yote that some of you guys might be familiar with that view. Um, and uh, thanks very much for listening to me. Please let me know if you've got any questions. Thanks so much, Bevan. Appreciate your time tonight um, and for sharing your insights during your presentation. Uh, as Bevan mentioned, we'll now turn the time open, uh, turn the time over to the Q and A session. So, if you do have a question, please uh, locate the Q and A section at the top of your screen, um, and you can type in a question there. We also have Nick Rumanada, um, who is here to answer any product-related questions for OSA. Um, so if there are any of those, Nick will be able to answer those. For all those joining tonight, we are using a different platform uh, than normal. We are using Teams, as you can see. Um, so it's a little different in regards to the Q&A session. So again, you will find the Q&A section located at the top of your screen where it mentions Q&A. We'll just leave this open for a couple more minutes. Uh, we have a question from Ian McDonald who asks how protective are knee braces in uninjured knees um, um, with a special focus on increased popularity in motocross? Yeah, uh, good question. And uh, we do uh, sell a lot of those functional knee braces to our patients and um, and I know that motocross and skiing are two super high risk ACL sports. And uh, similar to motocross, I'm aware that more and more professional motocross racers are, are buying uh, these functional knee braces um, prophylactically. And the same is happening with professional skiers as well. They are expensive, though also has done us a favor in, in getting the price down quite a lot from the CTI3. Uh, and I don't know that there's any study been done on it, 
but it seems to be that they are protective for an ACL and intuitively if you grab the brace and you understand how an ACL ruptures through either hyperextension or or you know violent torsional force that they do stop both of those things so quite a few of our patients we don't sell a lot of them prophylactically yet but quite a few people who've injured one knee will come back in a day and um, a day or two later and buy one for the other knee um, so I keep thinking and hoping from a business point of view that there's going to be a big growth in uh, in prophylactic brace sales that hasn't happened yet it's a little bit harder to convince people that something like that might happen to them um, and we kind of call it almost like a helmet for your knee um, and I do think probably uh, one of those functional knee braces does a better job in protecting knees than a, than a helmet does in pretending, protecting concussions. Um, maybe a bit controversial, but uh, I think it's probably true. Perfect. Thanks, Bevan. Um, Sean Tickner has a question here. Any benefit in long-term usage of ligament bracing following surgical repair? Uh I don't think bracing is that valuable post-surgery and I, I, um, from what I've read in the studies um, that for ACL provides a bit of comfort in the early stages. Um, the only, but as far as long-term brace, well short-term brace usage soon after the operation provides you know just a little bit of mental support I guess for the injured knee but you try and get them out of those braces depending on the surgery of course and if you need range of motion restriction or not depending on the surgery we leave that up to the surgeons um, but as far as preventing re-injury I don't think they're that effective um, but if someone's had an ACL say or another injury to their knee and then doing a sport that they know is going to be high risk in the future like skiing or motocross um, I'd certainly recommend those people to, to wear a brace during the actual sport, but as far as living their life with one, I don't, I don't really recommend that. Yeah, thanks, Bevan. Um, we've got a question from Jack who says, how long do you typically brace a high-grade MCL for, and do you change the angle that the knee is locked at over the bracing period? Yep, excellent question. And we... we so tend to wave a lot of the time the patients that we see leave and get taken you know they're in, in Japan for a holiday and, and we give them instructions and um, we don't necessarily uh, take care of their full term of their recovery and somebody else takes over but our instructions are normally six to eight weeks and we start at 30 to 90 and we do straighten it out after four weeks to sort of um, you know 20 to uh, to, to, to free range um, flexion after a lot of the time if they're wearing the brace they can't really fully fully bend but um, we try and be pretty strict in that first four to six weeks some people brace out to 12 weeks for MCLs we normally recommend eight um, yeah but once again there's not a, a huge consensus um, or research to prove one way or the other is better than the other Perfect. Thanks for that. Um, we've got another question from Rachel who asks, have you had much kickback or opposition from orthosurgeons when you suggest conservative measures as, approach, as opposed to surgery? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is something we're all having to deal with. Um, and particularly myself in Singapore, it's, it's a private health model here. And um, so, yeah, I've had a little bit. Um, a couple of sort of coded messages that I shouldn't be so vocal about pushing um, pushing anti-surgery and it's funny because as physios we're kind of neutral you know we probably make more money doing post-op physio than we do doing non-surgical because they need more physio because as I mentioned before they're, they're further away from being having a higher functional knee so I don't really have a financial um, dog in the fight really um, but I just you know trying to do what's right and yeah so you know surgeons are feeling a little bit nervous about this i think um but you know those guys can handle it they earn more in an hour than i earn in a month so i don't really feel too sorry for them but um yeah great answer um charles got another question for you here what's your thoughts on a rigid multi-ligament brace for pediatrics in skiing or motocross what was that a rigid multi 
ligament brace for pediatrics in skiing or motocross? All oh, right. I guess the same answer as before. I think those, if, if the brace is going to be effective, it has to be it has to be rigid. You know, having those simple plastic stay or metal stay braces like your Osser Form Fits or whatever, they're not going to stop ligament damage. They have to be like the CTI or the or the sorry guys, the Breg CX2K is another really excellent ski brace. Um, and as far as for pediatrics, I mean, kids do do MCLs and they do do ACLs, so there's no reason why. And um, a lot of them are a little bit more clumsy, and most of them are beginners. So, uh, you yeah, know, I would see no, I would, see, I'd have no problem in in people in kids and children and those high risk sports um, being encouraged to wear braces preventatively as well. Perfect. Thanks, Bevan. And we've got another question here. With PCL injury two to three weeks down the line, what range of motion would you recommend in the knee when patient is fitted with a PCL brace? Yeah, good question. My brother-in-law actually just had a PCL and I've been kind of giving him advice um, down the line. And I think if you, if you spend that extra money on the PCL brace, what you're really buying there ahead of the Zimmer splint is, is that increased freedom, I think. So I just kind of said zero degrees is probably your ideal position, but if you're being diligent, you're wearing that brace and you're keeping it on well and the, the ratchet done up to a, a reasonable level that it is providing that force, that's you're paying for your little bit of extra freedom that you can use your zero to 60 degrees for the um, eight weeks of restriction or six to eight weeks or whatever you decide to do so i just say use that freely but if you're hanging around the house your knees probably better um, straight as much as possible and definitely sleep in the brace as well Alrighty, thank you so much, Bevan, and thanks, Nick, for um, the Q&A session. And again, thank you, Bevan, for joining us tonight for the OSA webinar and for presenting uh, your val valuable insights on this topic. Uh, for all those at home, thanks so much for joining. Um, we really appreciate it. And um, we hope to see you at the next OSA webinar. Uh, this, this completes the webinar series for Bracing Supports for 2023. However, we're really excited and working heavily on a great uh, webinar offering for 2024. So please watch this space. A reminder that tonight's webinar has been recorded uh, and a recording will be sent to you via email uh, once this is uploaded to our website. Uh, feel free to also go to the OSA website for all uh, post recordings of all our webinars for the remainder of this year, uh, for the entire of this year and also years prior. Uh, there is much valuable content on there. We hope all participants tonight have found the presentation interesting and have learned something new. And thank you again for joining us tonight and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, everyone.